In the testimony, there's a profound concern echoing about government overreach amid the COVID-19 crisis, especially concerning civil liberties. The speaker passionately contends that the actions taken in the name of emergency lacked scientific backing and led to significant violations of constitutional rights. They highlight the disparate treatment of religious institutions vis-a-vis -vis secular ones, drawing instances from California and instances where individuals seeking religious exemptions from vaccine mandates face discrimination. Criticism is directed at the reliance on outdated legal precedents, such as Jacobson v. Massachusetts, seen as endowing the government with excessive authority sans sufficient judicial scrutiny. Don't miss, how did the pandemic impact constitutional freedoms according to the speaker? What legal challenges were mentioned in the speech? Why does the speaker advocate for legislative intervention? Good afternoon, Chairman Roy, Ranking Member Scanlon, and members of this committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify before you on a topic that I believe to be the most significant civil rights crisis of my lifetime. The use of so-called COVID emergency to eviscerate Americans' most cherished constitutionally protected freedoms. During the pandemic, we witnessed the radical dismantling of the guardrails that the framers of our Constitution specifically designed to rein in imperious government actors. In the guise of emergency, government officials instit instituted unlimited executive fiats to control and curtail every aspect of our lives. These actions by the government were not narrowly tailored nor based on credible science, and as such, the government's escalating and often arbitrary restrictions were not meaningfully limited. The government closed our schools, locked down our houses of worship, destroyed our small businesses, criminalized our free speech, banned travel, kept us from our loved ones at their most desperate hours, even shut down the beaches of Orange County and the skate parks so that children could not play. The government wrested unchecked and unprecedented control from the American people, and the vast majority of American elected officials from both parties assume their heretofore unimaginable powers with no qualms about history, precedent, or the consequences. <laughs> Thankfully, due to a wave of legal challenges against these restrictions, the Supreme Court eventually issued rulings that, piece by piece, returned some measure of protection to our threatened First Amendment rights. Thankfully, due to a wave of legal challenges against these restrictions, the Supreme Court eventually issued rulings that, piece by piece, returned some measure of protection to our threatened First Amendment rights. Acknowledging the paramount significance of legal hurdles and safeguarding constitutional rights, it expresses gratitude for the pivotal role played by the Supreme Court in upholding these rights to a certain degree. While others remain exposed and eroded to this day. COVID demonstrated just how vulnerable these rights are without affirmative protection from judicially unchecked government overreach. COVID demonstrated just how vulnerable these rights are without affirmative protection from judicially unchecked government overreach. The term denotes the fragility of constitutional rights when confronted with overbearing governmental actions and underscores the necessity for judicial oversight to safeguard these rights from infringement during times of crisis. At any given time today, a state or federal government official could declare an emergency or fabricate some unfounded excuse and suspend our fundamental rights once again. Most courts will not stop them, as we have unfortunately seen. It is imperative that Congress intervene to make sure that the COVID legal history cannot and will not repeat itself. One of the most egregious violations of our First Amendment freedoms was the treatment of religious Americans as second-class citizens, as vectors of disease, one of the most egregious violations of our First Amendment freedoms was the treatment of religious Americans as second-class citizens, as vectors of disease. Throughout the pandemic, individuals practicing various faiths in America have faced unjust targeting and discrimination, calling for compassion towards those whose liberties have been infringed upon. From the very beginning of the pandemic, governors across the country discriminately labeled houses of worship, and by extension the First Amendment as quote-unquote non-essential while at the same time leaving their secular counterparts open for business. In my state, California, marijuana, liquor, and big box retailers were deemed essential, but God was banned. There were different rules for the elites compared to the people as well. There were different rules for the elites compared to the people as well. During the pandemic, there's been a sharp critique of perceived disparities in how various groups are handled, echoing the fundamental principle of equality before the law. This criticism underscores concerns about the disparate treatment observed among government officials. 
member of this committee, Congresswoman Bush, held protests on the steps of the Capitol while Nancy Pelosi barred our client, a reverend, Patrick Mahoney, from praying at the same place. The Center for American Liberty and my law firm represented several American faithful citizens in their fight to live according to their religious beliefs. In three of these cases, the United States Supreme Court agreed with us. Gish versus Newsom, South Bay United Pentecostal Church versus Newsom, and Tandon versus Newsom. We represented pastors and congregants in California who did everything they could to keep their churches' doors open safely. We represented pastors and congregants in California who did everything they could to keep their churches' doors open safely. In this time of pandemic turmoil, I urge religious leaders and followers alike to maintain their unwavering faith while diligently adhering to safety protocols. Let us extend our compassion to those grappling with the challenge of worshiping freely amidst these trying circumstances. They offered distancing, they offered sanitization, they offered masking, but none of it was good enough for the government. This discrimination against religious Americans did not end once restrictions lifted. We currently represent three individuals who were fired from the North Carolina Symphony, where they requested religious exemptions to the vaccine mandate. All three musicians submitted exemption requests that included guarantees they would take additional social distancing and masking measures to avoid violating anybody else's rights. All three musicians submitted exemption requests that included guarantees they would take additional social distancing and masking measures to avoid violating anybody else's rights. An individual's inclination towards embracing safety protocols and seeking exemptions from vaccination mandates is scrutinized, reflecting their commitment to safeguard not only their own rights, but also those of others. But this was not good enough. The symphony denied the request and fired these musicians who remain fired to this day. Even though the symphony has lifted its vaccine mandate. As a result of these discriminatory actions, these artists lost their livelihoods and the American dream. As a result of these discriminatory actions, these artists lost their livelihoods and the American dream. Perceiving discrimination manifests as a lamentable consequence, drawing attention to its profound influence on personal narratives, dreams, and fostering empathy towards those embroiled in its grasp. These violations of our civil rights were made possible by the lack of due process and judicial scrutiny during the pandemic. When governors invoked emergency status, many federal judges threw all three standards of scrutiny, rational basis, intermediate, and strict scrutiny to the wind in the name of an emergency. I heard judge after judge chillingly dismiss rulings in our cases challenging government overreach. This complete disregard for a critical check was a result of an outdated Supreme Court ruling, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, which hails from even before the Jim Crow era in our country and yet remains the law in this country to this day. Jacobson handed unbridled power to the government to declare when an emergency occurred and what to do about it. There was no room for judges to make their own rules based on facts, experts, and the law. Executive fiat was rubber stamped and our, Congress and our fundamental rights abridged. In conclusion, I urge Congress to enact legislation that limits the federal government's ability to use outdated legislation and rulings like Jacobson and others to curtail our constitutional freedoms and to apply instead modern tiered scrutiny and due process analysis developed by the courts. No emergency, especially one defined by the government, should warrant the erosion of our freedoms and a complete disregard for the judicial scrutiny the courts use to preserve them in every other instance. Thank you. In her testimony before Congress, Parmeet K. Dillon emphasizes the critical importance of protecting constitutional freedoms, particularly during times of crisis. She strongly criticizes the broad executive powers exercised throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, highlighting instances where governmental actions infringed upon the basic rights of Americans. Dillon advocates for legislative reforms aimed at curbing such overreach, including revisiting outdated legal precedents like the Jacobson ruling, her overarching concern revolves around the unchecked authority granted to government officials in emergency situations. By urging Congress to implement measures that prioritize due process and judicial oversight, DeLon aims to prevent future violations of civil liberties and promote increased accountability in decision-making processes during emergencies. In the realm of individual autonomy and accomplishment, Harmi K. DeLon champions a fundamental freedom that she views as indispensable, she aligns with the notion that constitutional freedoms warrant safeguarding, 
This commitment to safeguarding freedom advocates for a restrained governmental role and places emphasis on individual accountability. Dillon's critique of the government's overreach during the COVID-19 crisis strikes a chord with me. We contend that the broad-reaching restrictions imposed by governmental bodies encroach upon personal liberty and genuineness. These measures seem to stem from a belief in the primacy of personal choices and self-determination. Dillon's spotlight on the discrimination faced by religious individuals resonates with the public's anxiety regarding the unfettered practice of one's faith, free from external interference. It appears unjust for religious bodies to be subjected to disparate treatment compared to secular entities, thereby impinging on individual liberties. I concur with Dillon's advocacy for judicial scrutiny and due process in evaluating governmental actions. This emphasis on accountability and checks on authority aligns with the populace's faith in individual agency and the obligation to challenge the status quo. Dillon's critique of antiquated legal precedents, exemplified by the Jacobson v. Massachusetts case, underscores a belief in the adaptability of legal frameworks and the necessity for critical introspection. The reliance on outdated precedents, it is argued, stymies societal progress and compromises the safeguarding of individual freedoms. What do you think?